Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to your planet, my planet, planet hog, baby, back up in your orbit once again. Ah, we're going to get it started the right way. I uh, spent a good portion of yesterday watching the Rocky, there was like a Rocky marathon on... Um, Trying to think what, what network that was. Uh, I think it was Sundance. But uh, no, it definitely was Sundance. It was Sundance. Um, and uh, I don't really watch Sundance a lot. I don't know a whole lot about it. It looks like one of those little annoying indie networks. Um, but, you know, aside from the fact that the periodically the sound would just drop out in the middle of the movie, which is really, really annoying. Aside from that, I enjoyed it, man been a while since I watched. I didn't catch the whole thing, actually. By the time I started watching, they were already on um, Rocky 3, which mm, or Rocky 3 is probably my favorite one, uh, to be honest with you. Clubber Lang, you can't, you can't beat that. He was uh, very good, very, very entertaining. Um, it was a very good story. Actually, all of the Rockies were really good, um, especially I can appreciate them a little bit more now, obviously, as I'm older. And uh, at the time I watched them when I was younger, but anyway, watched uh, three, four, and five, and I always liked four. Um, four was the soundtrack for four was. You, I don't think there's another movie that beats that. The Rocky soundtrack for Rocky Four, or the movie soundtrack for Rocky Four. I I don't know if there's another one that comes close to that. Arts of Fire, uh, No Easy Way Out, uh, you know. Um, Shoot, what's the other one? Living in America. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't I don't know that there's um Two Worlds Collide. Oof. I don't know if there's another one that beats that. Um So I watched Rocky Four. It's always hard to watch Apollo die. Um Yeah, it's always hard to watch Apollo die. But uh then Rocky Five, which coming into it I was like, you know. I just remembered I didn't like it. I don't. Rem I didn't remember why. I've only seen it maybe a handful of times, but uh, watched it. And I'll tell you what, I actually like Rocky Five. Um, let me adjust this here a little bit. Getting some very negative feedback, but um, yeah, I, I I actually like Rocky Five. Watched it now. It's it's very. It's it's it took a different approach to storytelling right because every movie we always see everything always ends well for the hero and it, actually rocky five is kind of a sad story it's kind of a tragedy um because obviously for those of you who haven't seen it uh number one you should be ashamed of yourself uh number two rocky five so after rocky four he beats ivan drago which was a fight that he didn't get paid for he was just kind of doing it on principle to avenge apollo and america and uh, he comes back home to find out that Pauly, uh, his brother-in-law, Adrian's brother, had pretty much screwed up their finances by signing away power of attorney to some crooked lawyer who pretty much fleeced them and used all of their uh, liquid assets and all of their money to finance some kind of real estate project that went belly up. So Rocky was pretty much broke. So he had to move back into his old his old neighborhood, which had fallen on harder times and become kind of a ghetto. And um, Adrian had to go back to work at the pet shop, and Rocky was working as a trainer at the old gym. Um, and then Tommy Morrison comes along, Tommy Gunn, excuse me, Tommy Gunn comes along, and uh, Rocky kind of invests in his prospect, only to have that prospect plucked away and kind of turn his back on him. It's it's a, kind of a sad story. Rocky's dealing with head injury, traumatic brain injury. So, and I didn't catch this when I would watch it, but he's, so his character, if you pay attention to his dialogue, his lines, he's, you can, he communicates that in how he speaks. He's he, like, he, obviously Rocky was never the brightest guy, but his speech pattern is significantly worse in Rocky V. Um, he can't place words. He can't really remember and recall things. He's, he has a hard time talking. It's a really a interesting take um, and a harrowing kind of uh, look at 
boxing, right? And and the long term effects of you know what happens when um, when the lights go out, uh, figuratively in terms of their career, um, and the and the injuries that they're left with. But anyway, I didn't come here to talk to y'all about that. But uh, man, I do I did appreciate Rocky Five. I will tell you that. Uh, yesterday, I kind of alluded to a topic that I said I would discuss today. I said, uh, I do not believe in quote unquote white privilege as it were, but I do believe, cause again, um, for those of you who didn't catch it, the reason why I don't believe it is because you can go to places. You can go, hell, you can go places here in Florida, uh, up closer to the panhandle, um, up on the outskirts of Gainesville, talking to Ocala, places like Wildwood. Um, then there's obviously places like Appalachia, places in the outskirts of Nevada, places in Oklahoma, places in Ohio, places in Indiana, where obviously that whole narrative falls apart because their skin color did not get them anything. They work nine to five hours, sometimes more than that for little, for very little money. Um, and I think it's very insulting for people to kind of, uh, assume like you had Don Lemon say on his show at one point that, uh, you know, if you're not rich and you're white, you're doing it wrong. Well, that's kind of funny. Number one, considering that he's very wealthy and he's not white. And then number two, considering that he's married to a white man. So it's, it's funny how that works. You know, half of your quote unquote wokies. Uh, they go home to the very people that they criticize and um, name as public enemy number one. I, I'm not sure how that dynamic works. But anyway, I said that uh, while I don't believe in white privilege per se, I do believe in liberal p- privilege. And today I want to get more into that. Um, and basically breaking it down, I th- uh, in my theory here, I have three kind of outlined points of Liberal privilege, as you know, I have gone, resorted to maximum lubrication there. Jotting down some of my thoughts here so I don't, you know, when I turn it off, then I'm like, ah, I forgot to say this. But anyway, so point number one of liberal privilege and the luxuries afforded therein is the ability to be unfettered by tangibles. And by tangibles, I mean concrete evidence, right? We've seen numerous times that facts are optional when it comes to liberals. And this is a privilege they have. For example, I'll use probably the most uh, infamous example is that is the argument that Trump said there are good people on both sides in Charlottesville. Now, for those of us who live in the real world, for those of us who can read, for those of us who can do basic research, that fell apart almost instantaneously. But for some reason, this lie has been able to kind of live in perpetuity. Because, again, the facts are optional. And it's not even as if these were different speeches where this lie was debunked. It was literally the same sentence. So, and again, there are plenty of other examples of where facts have become optional. But, for example, there is very, well, we could talk about coronavirus. We could talk about masks, the mask mandate, and how there have been numerous other scientists who said, "Mm, the masks really aren't doing what you think they're doing. Eh, The lockdowns really aren't helping. But, again, they've been ignored, and in, in most cases, silenced. So, again, the ability to kind of dismiss any kind of factoid that is disaccording to your narrative is a privilege held by liberals. Along those same lines is science. Science with them is like a, I I, I liken it to a light switch. You know, when you enter a room and uh, you want the light on, you flick the switch. When you leave, when you don't want the light, you turn it off. And that's what the, it's literally what they do with science, right? They're the first to call you a science hater. um, If you don't agree with whatever they're trying to push in that moment in the name of science. But at the same time, for example, something like, I don't know, climate change is going to kill us. Lie. Hysteria. Lie. Climate change has been happening since the inception of this planet. We don't know that it will kill us. But if you don't believe that, then you're anti-science. 
right? If you don't support the Green New Deal, you're anti-science. But at the same time, these are the same people that will tell you that a man, there's no such thing as gender. There's no such thing as sex. A man and it can be a woman and a woman can be a man. Now, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a biologist. But I'm pretty sure that's not true. On a scientific, on a scientific ground, right? So, again, these are the same people who tout science until it's time for them to kind of weigh their own policies and measure their own policies up against science. In which case, we just kind of flick that switch and science is off. So, piggybacking on the ability to dismiss any kind of factoid that is disaccording, they can also dismiss any kind of science that's disaccording. The last point I want to bring up with that, in the ability to kind of explain away anything that's disaccording, would be their own policies, their own things that they tout. At the top of that list, I would say is tolerance. Ready? Because for most of us who are old enough to remember, that was their battle cry in the early 2000s, was tolerance and respect, tolerance and respect, tolerance and respect. But what do we see now? Do we see tolerance in these liberal strongholds? Do we see respect? Uh, when you have people who are of a different political philosophy being shot, being hit with cars, being beaten, being arrested and fired from their jobs, you know, I, it's amazing to me the seamlessness of how they can just kind of pivot in the second whenever they're up against something that flies in the face of what they're trying to achieve in that moment, regardless if it's something that they've previously stood for. Um, so, again, the ability for them to pivot on anything that they have touted previously as a value is also a liberal privilege. In Tier 2, we have what I like to call democratic immunity. And that basically is, as it sounds, sounds like diplomatic immunity, the policy where diplomats of foreign countries kind of get allowances within, they're not held to the same standard, the same legal standard as you or I. Now, this is something I disagree with uh, vehemently. If anything, they should be held to a higher standard because they're not a citizen. And if you're not a citizen and you come here and you start trouble, especially if you're a government official of another country, uh, that can be taken a number of ways. So um, just to digress briefly and give you a little quick hit, a little jab on how I feel about diplomatic immunity, but back to my, my point here of democratic immunity. So along those same lines, they're not responsible for their poor actions. The fact that, and I'll give you an example right now, the fact that Joe Biden is allowed to run for office when, number one, we have the whole Hunter Biden thing, right? We have his name as a beneficiary of all of those dealings to include China, right? We have something that a lot of people may have forgotten about by now. We have the whole Tara Reid, what happened to Believe All Women? Tara Reid talking about how Joe Biden forcibly penetrated her uh, with his fingers. What happened to Believe All Women? Well, that's in that was in point one. They're unfettered by tangibles. The ability to pivot on anything they had previously touted, right? Me Too was good then, it's bad now. Got it. So, but that's that democratic immunity. Joe Biden should not be running for office at this point. Joe Biden should be running for office just by virtue of the fact that he is a declining old man. But we're supposed to act like this isn't happening. We're, we're supposed to act like he has a stutter, even though no one has ever heard this man stutter previously to this year. And by stutter, we mean um, not be able to finish sentences, not know where he is, uh, mi frequently misplace people and words. But that's, that's a stutter. I got it. Okay. Also, under democratic immunity, and this was just added as of this year, is selective enforcement of the law. All right? And obviously, this is not across the board, but I'm thinking of two places in particular. Number one, I'm thinking of New York City, where I just actually saw a tweet yesterday, and I will include that in the description box for those of you who are very 
interested in this. Um, I saw a tweet yesterday where you had the NYPD actually going to the homes, the private homes of Jewish citizens and breaking up meetings that they were having there. And, you know, I kind of tweeted about this yesterday. Hey, hey, um, you know, I'm just over here waving my waving a flag like, hey, guys, uh, we're kind of kind of going down a bad road here. We, we've kind of we've kind of this this has happened before and it didn't end very well for for humanity. Right. It was kind of a bad look for all of us. Um, and it's amazing to me the accretion of. Um, legal offensive kind of uh, restrictions and, and actions taken specifically against Jewish people in New York, right? Because, and there was some guy who, you know, I try to, when I engage with people on Twitter, man, I try to be as respectful as possible because again, we're, it, it's internet talk. So there's no point in, you know, this, this kind of tough Tommy bravura that some people have. It's like, you, you, you fucking idiot. Yeah, you're so stupid. I'll fuck you up. I don't get with that, man. It's, it's, you'll never meet me. And if you did, you wouldn't talk like that to my face. I guarantee it. So, and, and, and on top of all of that, it's not, it's not a, it's not conducive. Like it's, it's completely unnecessary to having an actual discussion where you're trying to maybe change some people's minds. So anyway, but when you look at these things and this, and this person in particular said, well, you know, it's the law in New York. You're not allowed to gather. It's not a Jewish thing. I disagree, sir. I disagree, sir. Excuse me. You're right. It is, it is the law in New York that you're supposed to, there's a restriction on the number of people that can gather. But what happened to all those Black Lives Matter rallies? Why wasn't the law applied there? Why wasn't the law applied to all of those Antifa kids that went around smashing up stuff? Why wasn't the law applied there? So when you apply the law, that's the problem when you don't apply the law evenly, hence selective enforcement of the law, that it becomes harder and harder to defend the point that it is not specifically targeting a group of people. Because if it wasn't, you would apply it to everybody, which they don't in New York. And again, I'll include the link to that article uh, in the description box. Also, under selective enforcement of the law, we had the McCloskeys in St. Louis, right, where rioters came to their private community, uh, trespassed, number one, then trespassed on their property. They brandished firearms to in defense of their selves and their, their home, and they were the one. They're the ones who are facing criminal charges right now, not the people who are breaking the law, breaking the law, right? Breaking the law, breaking the law. No, but they were literally breaking the law, breaking the law. Because they were trespassing on private property after they trespassed in this neighborhood. So it was a double, maybe it's a double negative thing where you multiply negative and negative, cancels out to positive. Maybe that's where they're going. Some kind of loophole I'm not f familiar with. That's fine. Um, and then again, another place where you have a selective enforcement of the law, obviously, is in Portland. Where their DA is routinely, routinely dismissing charges against rioters. Completely dismissing charges. Uh, which is obviously allowing these people, okay, well, if I'm not going to get in trouble for it, I'm going to go down and do it again. So another benefit of the liberal privilege under the subheading of democratic immunity. The final one, excuse me, that kind of runs parallel to the first point is you're not responsible for violations of the liberal code of conduct as long as you're a member in good standing. All right. You're allowed to kind of break our own rules as long as, number one, you still have political utility, i.e. Joe Biden, because I'll tell you what. Now, I have a couple theories for what happens if Biden wins, because number one, I don't think he, I don't, number one, I don't think he makes it through the term, but also number two, on top of that, I don't think he makes it a year. I think he's literally just a Trojan horse, right? I think, well, figuratively. I think he's figuratively just the Trojan horse, right? Where he's going to get Kamala Harris in and then, and then we'll hear about Tara Reid. When we, need, when we need to make Joe disappear, then we'll hear about Tara Reid. You know, I don't think they've forgotten about that story. I think they, what they've done is they've just kind of pigeonholed it. It's like, okay, well, we'll hold, we'll hold on to this until we need it. Because that's what they do. They get the dirt on you. And when they don't need you anymore, then they take you down. 
right? So, um, democratic immunity, ladies and gentlemen. And the third point of liberal privilege is what I like to call the oppression Olympics. And the oppression Olympics, basically, by that I mean, it's essentially a competition of all of the quote-unquote minority groups where the winner is the person who can point to suffering the most amount of oppression. Like, the winner is the person who is oppressed the most, hence the Oppression Olympics. Um, So you have all these different groups, gays, blacks, Hispanics, women, all competing to have the title of the most oppressed. And this is where intersect the intersectionality matrix comes in, right? It's, it's, it's almost like a grid, like battleship. That's how I envision it, where it's like, okay, I am a black female lesbian. Okay, so G1, L2, okay, so I have this many points of oppression. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's almost a competition. It really is. It's a competition to be the most victimized. And what do you win? What is your gold medal? Well, your gold medal is the right to oppress others with impunity. That's your gold medal, which kind of piggybacks on the third sub point of democratic immunity, not responsible for violations of the liberal code of conduct, as long as you're in good standing, right? So if you win these oppression Olympics, which everybody's a winner, right? Because liberals, participation trophies, everybody wins, but not everybody gets the gold. So everybody who's in one of these minority groups can oppress, but it's a question of who you can oppress, how much you can oppress them, what you can say. And there's a caste system as far as that goes, right? Which is why you see a lot of these, a lot of the more um, discriminatory and sensitive stereotypical things coming out of the mouths of people who are either gay, black, Gay and, and these are not mutually exclusive, right? Because if you're gay and black, oh, we can get you to say more stuff. So, female. So, it's... And the thing, and the point about that is... Why would you allow them to do that? Well, well, think about it now. If we allow these people to oppress other people... But at the same time, we're simultaneously telling people, no, 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 they're not oppressing you. They can't. They don't have any power, which is insane, which is insane. I am not a government official. I am not a person that holds any kind of political standing. But I can be oppressive to someone I meet on the street. So this notion that you need some kind of um, political power behind you, that you need some kind of clout and authority in the way of the ability to affect legal action uh, is nonsense. It's complete nonsense. There's an old lady walking the dog down the street, and I walk outside every day and knock the trash over in front of her as she's trying to walk, call her a bunch of names, stand in her way and impede her progress. I'm oppressing her. So... There's no, we can just dispel with the horseshit of you having to be some sort of political, um, being some kind of political person, having some kind of political power, having some, any kind of power other than your physical self, because that's really all that's needed to oppress somebody. You just need to be mightier than they are in that moment. You need to affect some kind of negative consequence in their life. You just basically have to make them act against their will in a negative way. And you have oppressed them to some degree. But the ability to do this only ensures that the Olympics will continue. (laughs) Right? Because if I, excuse me, if I am a person in these Olympics and I oppress another group, let's say uh, the the uh, black, trans, whatever, start oppressing the regular white liberal gays, right? Well, obviously by doing that, I'm ensuring that these white liberal gays are still feeling oppression. Now, again, this is where the mental gymnastics come in to keep them from targeting this other group, the black trans 
liberals, I'll say things like, well, they don't have, they can't oppress you because they don't have power. So now they're feeling the oppression, but they need a target to kind of uh, blame as to why they're feeling it. And then that's when you point at people who don't subscribe to the oppression Olympics, namely conservatives. So it's, it's, it's really amazing this game that they play where they'll oppress each other and then blame it on an outside group that has really nothing to do with them. Um, but again, it serves the purpose of ensuring the Olympics will continue. And that brings us to a very interesting tweet that was apropos for today from a person whom everybody's kind of talking about right now named Chelsea Handler, right? And for those of you who don't know, um, 50 Cent recently tweeted uh, some kind of flippant endorsement for Donald Trump and received backlash for it, right? And Chelsea Handler took it upon herself to tweet the following. Hey, fucker, I will pay your taxes in exchange for you coming to your senses happily. Black Lives Matter. That's you, fucker. Remember? And I will include a link to this tweet as well in the description box. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Oppression Olympics at its finest because you have a white female, which somehow, again, has kind of manipulated their way into this discussion. Which is funny, right? Because Bill Burr just did a monologue on SNL recently. And I'll throw that in there as well. But Bill Burr just did a monologue on SNL recently saying, you know, hey, white women, um, if we're going to call out the evils of the white man, you were beside us. And he's 100% correct. He's 100% correct. Uh, there are white women in the Klan. There are white women who are Nazis. To me, those two facts alone disqualify you from being able to separate yourself from the quote-unquote evil white man. If we're going to play that game, then you go over there with them. So, um, but yeah, Chelsea Handler's been able to make that tweet. And there it is. And no one will say anything. Guarantee it. She, maybe she, eventually, if the heat gets hot enough, she'll post some kind of tearful apology where I, I just, I, the fact that people are calling me racist is just inconscionable. Right. Well, but this will probably get a pass. This will probably get a pass, number one, because she's a liberal in good standing. Aha. That's, that's tenant number two. Uh, number three, because she's a female. So she's somehow an oppressed person, a white female at that. She, so somehow she's oppressed. Um, even though, you know, it's funny to me that they've been able to kind of wear this mantle that, you know, all the fe white females have been oppressed throughout history. There are literal civilizations in the BC era that were run by white women. You know, there are, you're so oppressed. Most of the, who was the subject of most of the art of repute today? Mona Lisa, right? Who, who, who's the subject of all of this? So I, the fact that they've been able to kind of weasel their way into this, and you know, it is what it is. It's, it's, it's. In my opinion, um, there's access there because, well, I'll say that for a different episode. <laughs> I'll say that there for a different episode. That'll be good. Ooh, that'll be really good. But anyway. So you, so you have these comments by Chelsea Handler, right? Well, hmm. and again, I'm not expecting anything to come of it. I'm not expecting Black Lives Matter to say anything. Guarantee you that won't happen. Guarantee you that won't happen because she said, she number one, she touted them in there, but you're Black Lives Matter, right? Well, Black Lives Matter won't say anything. And people say, well, Black Lives Matter is only for police brutality. Well, then say po police brutality against black people is an issue. Change your name. Because with the name Black Lives Matter, you can't then after that subsequently start to dissect and make your approach uh, more microscopic in terms of the things that you are looking to affect change in. Change your name then, right? I mean, I can't, I can't start a group talking about uh, Pet Lives Matter, right? And then when someone from the ASPCA comes up and says, hey, there was a dog beating down the street in your neighborhood. Can we do something about it? Do you want to protest it? And me say, well, I'm actually talking about heartworms. So no, I'm not going to actually protest that. You would look at me like I was insane. So, and not only insane, but a, a poser and a phony. And I would be, just like they are. So I guarantee you they won't say anything. 
I guarantee you the mainstream media will gloss over this as simply a comedian pushing the comedic bounds. Oh, she's just being racy. She's a comedian. Right? I guarantee you that won't happen. And I guarantee you all these quote-unquote white, white liberal allies, these wokey-wokes, I guarantee you they won't call her out on this either. But I would submit to you that that tweet, what she embodied in that tweet, is literally the most prevalent form of racism in America. It's not this, it's not Republicans, it's not Klansmen, it's not neo-Nazis. Those are not the most prevalent forms of racism in America right now. It's these wokey woke white liberals that say, well, since I'm a liberal, I can say anything I want to. I can be as racist as I want to because I'm a liberal. We can't be racist because I'm on your side. I'm on your side. Right. It's it's this paternalistic racism. And I'll, I'll explain the racism in that tweet. Because we're like, well, how's that racist? Well, the definition of racism. Let's pull it up. Let's pull it up. So you understand that I'm not using the term flippantly. We'll pull this up. I'll make this point and we will ride on out of here. Uh, let's see. Got all these updates for this goddamn computer. Okay. Computers. Computers. Racism. Oops, that was fascism. Racism. And let's use Merriam-Webster, even though they are increasingly losing credibility with me. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're not going to use Merriam-Webster because they have lost credibility with me. We'll go to dictionary.com. Dictionary.com. Racism. Okay. Boom. All right. Definition number one. A, oh, look, they've added institutional racism and structural race. Jesus Christ. All right. Well, they're losing credibility with me as well. But we're here. Definition number one. A belief or doctrine that inherent differences among the various racial human racial groups determine cultural or individual achievement, usually involving the idea that one's own race is superior and has the right to dominate others, or that a particular racial group is inferior to others. And some of you, some of my quick students, have already figured out how this applies. But I'll read it again, and then we'll go back to it. A belief or doctrine that inherent differences among the various human racial groups determine cultural or individual achievement, usually involving the idea that one's own race is superior and has the right to dominate others, or that a particular racial group is inferior to the others. Okay. How does this apply to her tweet? Well, I'll read her tweet one more time. And then we'll explain it. From Chelsea Handler. Hey, fucker. I hate when... I hate when... Women try to talk like guys. It's really annoying. Hey, bro. Hey, dude. Hey, fucker. I will pay your taxes in exchange for you coming to your senses. Okay? The implication there is that he's thinking outside of his natural mind, right? Happily. Black Lives Matter. That's you, fucker, remember? Okay, so we basically have two, two instances of the same violation. In this, she is essentially, the premise of this is that 50 Cent, Curtis Jackson, does not understand what he's doing. He is incapable of understanding his own reality. All right? So it took Chelsea Handler, a white woman, to kind of show this wayward Negro... How to think. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how that is racist. That's paternalistic racism. That's the soft, liberal, paternalistic side of racism, which is much more prevalent. You may have also heard it in comments like, wow, that's very white of you. Or, oh, this is the whitest black person I know. These are all on the White Liberal's Greatest Hits album. Right? Anytime you act in a way that is a stereotypical. And I mean a stereotypical as in one word, not stereotypical. Anytime you act in that way, it bothers certain people. And you have to ask yourself why it bothers them. And then that's a whole different discussion. But what you see with people like her is because she is overtly, like she's apparently been tossed around by a lot of different black dudes. So in her mind, you know, after the fourth or fifth dick that she sucked, uh, I now have gained some kind of, I've gained some kind of power now. 
I now have an ability that I don't have before. You also see this a lot of times, in my opinion, um, and not just in my opinion, my personal experience. You see this a lot of times with uh, multiracial families where, you know, dad's black, mom's white or uh, dad's white, mom's black. And then, then, you know, there's somehow some kind of pass where I can just say racist shit and it's okay. Because look, I've sacrificed. I'm, 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 I've, I've given you people my, my uh, look, I've lowered myself. I'm living amongst you. So, um, anyway, that, that, that's, that's how the liberal privilege works. I mean, that's how it works. And again, I, for all of the consternation that we hear about the stereotypical flag waving redneck racist, uh, I'm sorry, not seeing it. In fact, those are the people in my experience who are the most accepting, who are the most, and not just not necessarily accepting, but they give you a fair shake. They're open to having their mind changed. There's an honesty there. Not saying that there, there aren't racist people who are rednecks. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that the overwhelming majority, as it exists right now, especially in my own travels, are liberal. Hands down, not even close. And they'll make racist jokes, they'll make racist comments, and they'll be like, well, I'm just kidding. You know, I'm just kidding. And... They'll do it with impunity because they can't be racist because they're liberal. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that is liberal privilege today. I am going to check on up out of here. I appreciate all of my listeners, of course. Uh, if you disagree with me, obviously that's what the comment section is for. Don't tell me that I'm wrong. Tell me why I am wrong. And let's have a discussion about it. Other than that, I will check in with you guys later on. Until then, peace.